book. Anybody that's went to Bible school, you know, we have a school of ministry here. It's a repeat book. Uh, it's actually God's reminding the people of God once again, and he repeats himself. Almost everything you heard back in the book of Exodus and even numbers and God is repeating himself. He's talking to the people of God once again and again. There's something about hearing something over and over again. And isn't it true that sometimes we need to hear it more than once? Somebody shout amen. And that's why God saw it very, very important to repeat himself again and again. And I am reminded what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that we need to hear the word of God again and again because it builds our faith. Amen, somebody? So I'm going to pick it up. I know it says verse 7, but that's not actual context. Let's pick it up in verse number 1 very quickly. And I want you to hear in this translation what's happening here. God is giving a word to the people of God. This is, this, these were for God's people. Now, if you're a visitor and you don't know Christ, this word's for you too. So I want you to hear this. In, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. It's almost like a prison term got set free. <laughs> and this is the manner of the release. Every creditor, man, this sounds great shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. Well, of a foreigner, you may, you, you may request it, but whatever of yours is with your brother, your hand shall release. There will be no poor people among you, for the Lord will bless you. Look at your neighbor telling me, he really does want to bless you. In the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance to possess. Verse 5. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord. There's always what we call a prerequisite. Let me use a different word. There's always like a condition. Right, somebody? God is saying, I, I, I'm going to set you free from debt. I'm going to set you free from any type of curse. I'm going to set you free from any type of bondage. But there's something here you got to know. He says, I need you to really obey the word of the Lord. Somebody say amen. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all the commandments that I command you today, for the Lord your God will bless you as he promised you, and you shall lend to many people, many nations, but you shall never have to borrow. Somebody should say amen to that. You shall rule over many nations, but no one's going to rule over you. Now, here it is in verse number 7. If, if among you, one of your brothers, remember the word brother here, in the actual translation, just didn't mean men. It meant male and female. Follow this. If any among you, one of your brothers or sisters, let me add that in, shall become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your brothers because they're poor. But you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care. Lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart and you'll say, well, the seventh year, the year of release is close and your eye will look upon your brother grudgingly on your poor brother and you give him nothing. And then he's going to cry out to me, says the Lord, and you shall be guilty of sin. Look at verse 10. You should give to him freely and your heart shall not be grudgingly when you give to him because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work. Let me repeat that. You should give to him freely. And your heart shall not be grudging or being feeling bad about giving when you give it to him. Because, why? For this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and all that you undertake. Here it is, verse 11. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you should open up your hand wide and give to your brother. Give to the needy. Give to the poor in your land. Let's pray. Father, we thank you here this morning. And for the next few moments that we're here, I pray that you would open up our hearts and speak to us this morning in this particular area that uh, you really want to minister to us, to our community, to those that don't know you, Christ. So, Father, we ask you to open up our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, we all shout. Amen. Now, check this out. I wasn't going to speak on this 
I actually had, I'll be honest with you, I had a different message for this week and I felt the Lord in the last couple of days before Sunday, give me this word for our church because here's my title. Something happens when you open up your hands wide and you give. Can somebody shout amen? Oh, let me repeat myself for the hearing impaired. <laughs> Something happens when you open up your hands wide and you give. Let me repeat that one more time. Something happens when you open up your hands wide and you give. Somebody shout amen. Do you remember growing up when we wanted to go outside and play? And if it was cold, our parents would tell us, put on your coat. Because I don't want you going outside because you may catch a cold. Right, somebody? Or even as an adult, have you ever went to work and you're not feeling well and you're feeling kind of sick? And your co-workers tell you something, don't they? They say, don't touch me. Don't get close to me because I don't want to catch your cold. Right, somebody? Here in this chapter, follow me. This is an interesting chapter here. Here in this chapter, God wanted the Israelites to catch something. He didn't want them to forget. He wanted them to catch something. I, I, I got a word for somebody. God wants you to catch something here this morning that's going to benefit your, your, your family, your job, your career. It's going to benefit you as a person. Follow along this morning. This is very important. God wants you to catch something. Look at your neighbor tell him, God wants you to catch something. If we, if we basically just came to church for a feeling, then we lost it. Because church goes beyond a feeling. Somebody shout amen. It's exciting to feel the presence of God. Get excited with the music and the worship. But if we don't catch something as we leave this place, then we have gained nothing. So it's important that we catch something. That, that we open up our, our ears, open up our heart, open up our mind, remove any distractions in Jesus' name. Amen, somebody? He wanted these Israelites, and we're going to identify it to you and I. He wanted God's people. Let's use the word God's people. He wanted his people to catch something. He wanted them to catch this attitude of generosity toward the needy and the poor of their community. Follow me now. He wanted them to, to, to for those that were a, a little bit more uh, financially blessed, he wanted them to be a blessing. Listen, I'm not talking about money today. I'm talking about a whole different type of spirit here this morning. We're not talking about giving. We're not talking about money. We're talking about a different type of spirit here this morning. And God wanted these men and these women to catch something. Uh, and as he's, as he's speaking here to them, th there are some prerequisites. There are some conditions. And the condition was, I need you to really listen to what I want to tell you. I really need you to obey the word of the Lord so I can bless you. Now, he wanted them not to look down at people who were less fortunate than them. Because he wanted them to remember what he had done for them in the past when they were slaves back on Egypt. Come on, somebody. It's like, it's like God telling them, remember when you were down and out? Remember when you were needy yourself? Remember when you didn't have enough? Remember when you were barely making it? He wanted them to remember where they came from. I want you to see where you're at today, but I want you to remember where you came from. There's a tendency that once you're doing good and things are flowing and, they, and now uh, we, we look good, we smell good. We even put Christian cologne called eternity. I know some of you put on poison. Be careful. But uh, I use Christian cologne eternity and now we feel good. And now we brush our teeth and now we can smile. Some of us now even have teeth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And we're feeling good about ourselves. And God is saying, wait a minute. I just don't want you to forget where you came from. Somebody shout amen. amen. I don't want you to forget what I've done for you. It's easy once you hit now America, in spite of what you're hearing in the economy, we have a higher rate of middle class people than we've ever had. People that were barely making it now, that they've gotten raises, thank God. Now, now they're, that they're living better. And, and, and we're coming to a, a higher level of living. Of course, there's still a lot of people hurting. That's why he didn't want us to forget. But my point is, it, it, it's crucial and it's important that when God, once God has blessed you, that we don't forget where we came from. 
And God wanted to make sure that these people didn't start looking down at others. Oh, they don't dress like me. Oh, they don't look like me. Oh, they don't act like me. Oh, I don't like where they live. You go, wait, 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 wait. I need you to remember what I've done for you. God wanted them to remember where they came from, where he had brought them from, and where they were at today. How he had blessed them, and now they had the means to be blessed, to take care of their families, take care of their kids. And now we can shout hallelujah. Come on, somebody shout amen. Don't forget that. Now he says, you saw all that in those verses? Well, of course not. <laughs> You've got to read more than that. Those first 11 verses, you read a chapter prior. And you, as you're reading the book of Deuteronomy, he's reminding them where he pulled them out of. My only issue is that when I see people, Christians getting saved, not saved, getting blessed, sometimes we forget where we came from. And sometimes there's a, there's a lack of 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 empathy uh, or or sympathy well it's more empathy for people that are not where we're at and God is saying when you look at the poor when you're looking at the hurting when you look at the down and out I want you to remember that that was you I want I want you to remember that's where I pulled you out of I want you to remember what I've done for you Matter of fact, he tells him, and he tells us in Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse eighteen: Remember the Lord your God, for it is He who has given you the power to be wealthy or to get wealth. Now, another Hebrew word is success. It is I who has caused you to be successful. Where? In your marriage, in your family, in your job, in your career. Come on, somebody, that He may confirm His covenant, what He swore to your forefathers. Matter of fact, NLT says it this way, it is God who has made you successful. Sometimes we think it's our own accolades. We think it's our own ingenuity. We think it's our own mental ascent. We think it's what I've done. Look at all my achievements. Wow! You gotta say no, 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 no. Don't forget it, my friend. You have what you have because of the grace of God. If it wasn't for the grace of God, none of us would even be in this room this morning. Somebody ought to say thank you, Jesus. God is saying, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget what God has done for you. Your success, your career, your family, your sobriety, everything you have today is because of what God has done. I want us to set the, the, the record straight. It's what God has done. Sometimes I know we give people credit because they've helped us and thank God for that. Yeah, there's many people who are part of the process of our salvation, our deliverance, part of the process of our victory, part of the process of our success. And, and, and we thank people for it. And God is not coming against thanking other people for helping us. But what he's saying is, I don't want you to forget me. I don't want you to forget what I have done. Follow me now. Follow me. So what God does in this particular chapter is that God implements what's called a humanitarian act. What we see today. And so those that were poor or those that were in debt or those that couldn't get their life together, those that couldn't help themselves, he would have those that were a little bit better off and, and, and he would command them or instruct them. I'm going to use a different word. He would encourage them to be a blessing and a support to their brothers and sisters that were hurting. Don't go around the neighborhood and just say, oh, I'm going to pray about it. Prayer, some, absolutely, we believe in prayer. We have a prayer ministry. We believe in prayer. But sometimes we, we, we can be praying too much and God is saying, I need you to do something about it. And, and, and we're praying and, and we're down in our knees. Oh, God, help my sister that's poor. Help that brother that's needy. God is saying, get up. Get up from prayer and go and do something about it. Come on, somebody. Oh, open up your hands wide and start giving something. Can somebody shout amen? So what God does is that he implements this humanitarian act so that the people of the church house, people that were better off, can help those that were less fortunate. Now, you might think, wow, I thought the Red Cross started all this. No, the Red Cross didn't start this. Neither did the Salvation Army. Not even the nonprofit churches, uh, nonprofit church organizations. No, the truth is that God is the one that started this emergency relief program. And when I'm thinking about Run for Hope, I don't know if you know this, 
But if you're following Run for Hope, it's an evangelistical event that we do uh, from all the churches in America, all of our Victory Arts churches. We are now in 40 countries. So what we do is that all the churches in America, we raise up a little bit of finances and we send it to the headquarters so that we can support all the third world countries where we're at, where they're struggling and they're barely making it. And that's what we do. We help the brand new work that we have in Africa. We just started another church in Africa. One in, uh, um, oh my God, I lost track. There's just too many. Another one in New Zealand. We're going back to Ireland. We got another one in Panama. Uh, we got another one in Cuba. And I forgot how many we, we just started recently in New Mexico. So our ministry is growing. Why? Because of the need. There is such a tremendous need. And that's why when we say, come on, support, run for hope. Come on, help us. The money's not coming here. I wish it was. <laughs> it ain't coming here. It's going back right out. Every dollar is going right out so that we can help the needy, the poor, to look upon the communities that are hurting so that we can make an impact. And, 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 and I'm here to let you know that we're, right now we're number one in this entire region. Just this morning, we're... We're, 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 give me a second. We're $41 away from $44,000 that we've raised in the last couple of months. Come on, somebody ought to thank God. And it's not because we have a lot of rich people. We have a few of you here. But it's because of God's people. God's people seeing the need. And not only seeing the need, catching a burden and having compassion for the loss. Having compassion for the hurting. Having com compassion for the down and out. We can never come to church and think just because I'm saved and man we're doing great. That we forget about the one that's not. Think about that. I tell you the statistics that we had just in our state in Oregon of how many thousands of people we have lost in the last couple of years just on uh, overdose, uh, drug overdoses uh, besides alcohol, but even drug overdoses. I, I had the statistic, but I've already shared it. My, my point is you and I have to actually look beyond ourselves and say, God, what can I do? How can I open up my hands? How can I open up my hands? What is it that I can do to contribute, to make a difference in the kingdom? Listen to me, church. Every person in this room can make a difference in somebody's life. Everybody. You don't have to be up here. You don't have to have a degree like me. You, you don't have to have the, 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 the microphone. People outside of these four walls, right across the street from our church, are hurting. That's where we go to the streets every week, every other Friday. We're hitting the streets. We're evangelizing. We're letting people know that God loves them and God can transform them. Somebody shout amen. So God wanted the Israelites to catch it. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, catch it. Open up your hands wide and learn how to give. God wanted the Israelites to catch that. God wanted them to care about other people. God wanted them to care about their community. So oh, I don't care about the neighborhood. Sure, you have to. You're a Christian. Oh, I don't care what's happening in the Bahamas. We have to. We're Christians. Uh, oh, we don't care what's happening in Florida. That's not us. No, it is us. That's our family. Those are our people. Those uh, We got to pray for them. We got to do whatever we can to help them. God wanted these Israelites to catch it. Don't get so caught up with self that your world is just you, yourself, and I. The world's bigger than that. It's bigger than the four walls of this church. God's called us to go beyond the four walls. Somebody shout amen. God wanted the Israelites to catch this. God wanted them to care about people. Care about their community. Care about the down and out. Care about the poor. Care about the needy. And he wanted them to demonstrate it by how? Open your hands wide and start giving. Open your hands wide and start giving. Now, you're going to give him praise. Let's do it together. And let's give him a beautiful hand of praise. And did you know that when you give, it's not like you're, you're, you're losing anything. You're not. You see, the Bible states over and over again that God blesses those who are generous. That's the truth. Matter of fact, 
every Sunday morning, I know some of you don't know this, next door in our youth sanctuary, I have a 10-minute huddle. I meet with all the workers of the church at 10 o'clock in the morning, and I have a little 10-minute huddle, and I start giving them direction, getting them ready for church. Everybody, classroom teachers, the ushers, everybody that works here. And we have a little 10-minute huddle, and I was telling this praise report that just blessed me. This brother went on vacation on, uh, what was the last vacation? What was it called? Labor Day. He went on Labor Day, right? And he went Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. He just told us his story. He got home, and one of his neighbors called him, a friend of his, and says, Hey, brother, how was your vacation? Great. He goes, what did you spend? He goes, what do you mean what I spent? Yeah. What did it cost you for you and your kids to go to Cannon Beach? I think he went to Cannon Beach. He goes, I only spent about $500. No, that's not a lot of money, guys. Not for a family. I think they're five. You know, if you buy the kids a Happy Meal uh, three times a day for three days. And you might get yourself a filet of fish or you buy one hamburger and get the other one for free. Uh, you're still looking at about a $500 bill to take care of a family of five for the weekend. Well, lo and behold, it's a true story. The guy, he was just telling us the story again in our 10-minute huddle next door. He says, I got home, and this friend asked me, what did I spend, Pastor? And I said, what did you say? He goes, I told him the truth. I only spent 500 bucks. He goes, great, I want you to come, and I want to give you three times as much of, of what you spent. So he got, he spent 500, and he got 1,500 back. How does that work? It's called God. Somebody shout amen. Oh, I'm not finished yet. Not finished yet. This is a true story. I'll let you, I'm going to let him testify it, but he's not here right now. He's teaching in class next door. So he gets home. Two days later, an unexpected check. And that's happened to my wife and I, so I know this is true. He goes, we don't know where this came from, but a $3,000 check came from my wife. And we don't even know where it came from. Some back payments. So in, th in two days after he got back, one, two, three days after he got back, he got $4,500. Now, now you will say, oh, why are you telling us this? I'm just letting you know that when you learn how to give, you can never outgive God. Somebody shout amen. And God's going to make sure that he'll take care of you. You see, the Bible says it over and over again that God blesses those who are generous. Those who are willing to give of their time. Listen, I'm not talking about money. People that are willing to give of their time, their energy, their effort. And you go out of your way and you help your neighbor. Or you go out of your way and you help that sister that needs a ride to, to a doctor's appointment. Or, or someone that needs food and you take them a bag of food. You, you spend your own money. You don't call the men's home to give you a, a food box. You yourself go and you buy them food. Guess what happens? When we begin to learn how to be givers, God can help himself. He's going to give you back. Can somebody shout amen? Because that's the type of God we serve. Over and over again. 2 Corinthians, write this down, 9, 7, says that God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, God loves a generous person. That learns how to go out of their way and serve. And learn how to go out of their way and support somebody and help somebody. Listen church, the reality is this. You'll find more promises in the word of God about generosity than anything else. And I'll tell you why. Because God wants us to catch this concept, this principle, this new way of life. Where we learn that giving is not something to, uh, to hate. I'm going to just use that word. Something that is disgusting, but giving is something that is beneficial both for the person you're giving and for yourself. Can somebody say amen? And here's another important principle. That life does not consist in the amount of things we have, rather on the contributions of things that we give. Follow me. In other words, it's not what we have that really counts. It's what we give out. Can somebody say amen? It's what we give out. Let, let me give you a few points so you can believe me here this morning through the word of God. Here it is, number one. Here's number one. Generosity is more about attitude. It's not about a feeling. Generosity is about an attitude, not a feeling. That's what the Apostle Paul was trying to teach in 2 Corinthians 8.12. He says, whatever you give is acceptable if you give it with the right attitude. Give it according to what you have, not what you don't have. 
Come on, somebody, say amen. The contemporary English version says it this way. It doesn't matter how much you have. What matters is how much you're willing to give from what you have. Somebody say amen to that. Listen, the Apostle Paul is speaking about having the right attitude. That we learn how to give. Learn how to respond. Learn how to meet a need without the spotlight. Without sounding a trumpet. Hey, look what I've done. No, we don't need to do that. Because whatever we do in secret, God will reward openly. Somebody shout amen. What you do from your heart, God's going to take care of it, my friend. Listen, as a matter of fact, generosity isn't about your wealth. It's not about how much you have. Generosity is about having the right attitude. Come on, somebody. Some of you have a big fat bank account. And some of you don't even know what account you have. Understand this, that everything I really have, I think that a Christian needs to understand. Let, let me go here. Let me go here for free. This is for free. This is called a side note. We, I think we have to come to a place where we understand that we are not owners of anything. We are only stewards of what we have. Follow me now. The Bible declares that we are stewards. Does everybody know what a steward is? It means a manager. In other words, what you got, God has made you a manager. God has made you a caretaker of your family of your kids, of your job, of your home, of your finances. It really doesn't belong to God, to us. It belongs to God. Somebody shout amen. It's a matter of fact of knowing that everything I have actually belongs to God. I am only a manager. I'm only a steward of what God has given us. He's the real owner of everything. Can somebody shout amen? Everything belongs to God. And I think when we realize that and when we understand that, we won't be so self-centered. We won't be caught up so much with just me, myself, and I. Listen to what the Message Bible says in reference to Acts 15, 11. It says, we are saved because of the Master Jesus amazingly out of sheer generosity moved to save us. In other words, if it wasn't for God's generosity, we wouldn't even be saved this morning. Somebody say amen. Think about it. The very air that we breathe this morning is a gift of God's generosity. Come on, somebody. The blood that's pumping through our veins is a gift of God's generosity. The fact that our heart is beating blood every so many seconds is a gift of God's generosity. Everything I have, everything, including my job, my family, my kids, my career, everything is because of God. It's a gift of God's generosity that we, we're even alive this morning. Some of you should be dead right now. Well, excuse me. Some of us. <laughs> okay, I got to throw myself in there. That wasn't right. I was looking at Andy and Sal when I said that. You know, because those two guys, they know they should be dead by now. But they're still alive because of God's generosity. <laughs> Take out your mirror if you have one. We know that you all have mirrors. Look at yourself. Think about it. Think about it. It's okay when you look at yourself. That's why you're so caught up with selfies. And you're taking pictures. There's nothing wrong with that. You love you. You got to love you. If you don't love you, ain't no one going to love you. Right, somebody? Hey, nothing wrong with that. You wake up in the morning and, well, maybe not right after the morning. Maybe once you put a little bit of foundation, a little bit of eyeliner, and maybe once you do your hair, then you look at yourself. My God, do I look good. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Hi, beautiful. Now, some of you can't say that in the morning because you don't feel beautiful. But beauty is, is much, it's much deeper than the surface. Uh, there's an old joke. Don't get mad at me. They say, they say that beauty is only skin deep, but ugliness goes all the way to the bone. I didn't call you ugly. I didn't call you ugly. 
I'm just saying sometimes we can feel ugly. And I want to let you know that you're not ugly. We're all beautiful in the sight of God. Somebody shout amen. Let me clean this up. Let me clean this up. God's made you beautiful. Look how beautiful you are. Right? We're all beautiful in our own way. Big, small, skinny, blessed. We're all beautiful in the sight of God. Somebody say amen. None of us are supposed to look like Andy or Sal. I mean, you look at this. You look at Mark and if I wasn't a man, if I wasn't married, I'd probably date him. Uh, cool it, cool it, cool it. Cool it. I'm married. I'm married. Thank you, Jesus. And, you, you know, sometimes we look at ourselves and we, we don't feel that good. And God is saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Everything you got from the breath that you breathe, from the vocal cords, the words that you speak, the feet that you have, the hands, that, everything about you I have blessed you with. I am the owner of everything. God is moved, my friends, when we have this attitude of, 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 of giving. But let me go real quickly. Number two, generosity is about the condition of our heart, not the size of our wallet. Come on, somebody. It's not the size of your purse, sisters, the size of your heart. God is saying, when you look at people that are hurting, when you look at people that are down and out, don't despise them. Don't talk about them. Help them. I mentioned this before, and it's worth repeating, but the Bible speaks about giving over 20, uh, over 2,000 times. In other words, giving is mentioned three times more than love, seven times more than prayer, and eight times more than believing. You would ask the question, why is that? Because it is clear that God desires for his people to be a people of generosity. That we learn how to open our hands wide and we learn how to help somebody. We learn how to give out. We have to be careful. Because some of us, depending on the lifestyle or culture you come from, we can lean to two things. We can lean towards entitlement, which means, hey, man, they owe it to me. They owe it to me. You know, some of you say that. The truth is no one owes you nothing. Or we can fall into this uh, I don't care attitude. And, and it's important that we have to be careful that we have this attitude. I'm willing to give because I understand that what God has done for me. Something... You know what the Bible says about Jesus? That when Jesus saw the hurting, the down and out, you know what the Bible uses that word? He was moved by compassion. He was moved. It was like a gut feeling inside him that he couldn't help himself. He wanted to help somebody. The moment he saw somebody hurting, man, he wanted to help. And there's some of you like that here. I know a lot of you like that. That when you see somebody hurting right away, you want to go and tell them about our Christian recovery homes. You want to tell them about church. You want to tell them that there's a way out because there's something inside you. So, so God wanted these Israelites to catch it. You see, his very nature and character is about what? Giving. And just like he wanted the Israelites to catch this character, this godly nature, I truly believe he's telling someone here this morning who's battling with the area of generosity, he's telling you, I need you to catch it. I need you to catch something. Oh, I, I can't afford it. No, my friend, you can't afford not to give. You can't afford to hold back. Because when you hold back, God can bless. Follow me, follow me. Anybody that knows about agriculture, as I was preaching last Sunday, I worked in the agriculture for many years. If you don't plant a seed, you can't expect nothing back. A farmer understands I got to plant seeds in order to have a harvest. If you and I don't plant seeds. Hey, listen. If, you're, if you don't plant seeds of love, ain't no one going to love you. If you don't plant seeds of respect, ain't no one going to respect you. Right? I make people respect me. You know, people don't respect you. They probably fear you. They don't respect you. So that's the difference between fear and respect. And, and God wants us to be men and women. That, that we respect each other. Men and women that, that we, 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 we honor one another and we take care of one another. Somebody shout amen. So the, he wanted the Israelites to catch this. I, I need you to catch something that, well, God, we don't got what he has. 
We're not as wealthy as, as Brother Kevin. God says, I'm not comparing you. The biggest mistake we do in church is when we try to compare ourselves with somebody else. Right? You're not supposed to be somebody else. You're you. God has made you to be you and you alone. No one else like you. There's close to 7 billion people on planet earth. And God did not create a carbon copy of you. When God made you, he made you an original. So the moment God made you, he broke them all. And he said, that's it. That's the only one I'm making like that. Aren't we thankful for that? God for that we have two of you or me one of me is enough one of you is more than enough generosity is not how big your wallet is it's about your heart it's about your heart if you really say you care about people then you gotta show it Anybody can sound good behind the pulpit. Anybody can sound, oh, I know all these scriptures. Put the scriptures away <laughs> and open up your hands and start doing something. Amen, somebody. Here's number three. Boy, it's hot up here. I got about 2,000 watts hitting me all at one time. You can see everything about me, my pimples, everything. All the imperfections. And since we don't wear makeup or foundation. Well, some of us guys don't. Uh, this is hot up here. Here's number three. Generosity is always about willingness, not stinginess. One author said it best. He goes, the fastest way you can break the cycle of greed and materialism and just wanting more and more and more stuff is simple. He goes, be willing to give. When you're willing to give, then the whole focus is not just about you and me. It's about other people. Here's a key thought about generosity. God wants to make sure that he has captured our hearts and not things. What's captured your heart this morning? Where's London? Brother London, come back to the piano. I like that song. You guys were singing that worship song. Forgot the name of it. The hallelujah song. Think about this. Don't leave yet. Because uh, we still got to have you open up your hands. And give. I didn't pick up the offering. Because I wanted you to hear this message. And it wasn't a, a ploy to make you give more. No, you just be faithful. What you always do. But listen, my friend. Generosity is about willingness. It's about a willing heart. It's not being stingy. And when you learn how to look beyond yourself, then it's really not that hard to give. It really isn't. It's not that hard to give. I remember in our office, I see her today, Sister A.J. Johnson. Well, her name is Adrian Johnson. I call her A.J. Johnson. A.J.'s in the back. And she worked for us for about 18 years. And then she retired. And... Uh, there was one thing she always said every morning. But we would walk in the office right here, the church office. Hi, AJ. How you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. And I remember thinking about those words a lot. And I said, you know what, God? <laughs> As a pastor, I was saying, God, I want to feel blessed and highly favored. <laughs> Sometimes I don't feel blessed and highly favored, God. The stress of life, the overwork, all the extra hours at work, getting stressed out, and the pressure. Sometimes it's easy to cause you to lose it and lose focus of what really matters in life. God wanted these people to realize what really matters in life to you. What's most important? Because whatever is most important to you, that's what you're going to put your energy towards. If all you care is about fishing, I'm not against that. But if all you care is about fishing, then your whole energy goes to, to fishing. If all you care is about shopping, come on, guys. I didn't, wasn't going to talk about the girls only. <laughs> There's some guys here that have new shoes every week, new shirts. They love shopping. 
But if that's all you care about, that's where you're going to put your focus in. God was saying, listen, I'm not against you being blessed. As a matter of fact, I'm the guy that made you blessed. I'm the God who's made you blessed. I just want you to learn something. I didn't bless you. Listen to this. I'm almost done. Then we're going to have the ushers come up. Uh, I didn't bless you just so you can have more stuff. I blessed you so that you can be a blessing. Come on, somebody put your hands together. God wants you to be a blessing. Who helped you? Who helped you? 38 years ago when I was a mess, involved in drugs and in alcohol, somebody helped me. They came into my neighborhood, came to my house, knocked on the door, and they gave me a flyer to go to church to Victory Outreach. And it was that flyer that motivated me to go to this Christian church. And I heard there was a lot of people just like me in this church. And it says, man, you go there, God's going to bless you. And I remember going there, and I'm not lying to you. I didn't know nothing about Christianity. I was more of an atheist, and I was a believer. I walked, I, I, our family, we didn't go to church. I only went to funerals and weddings. I never have been really to a church service growing up. My daddy was too busy working, 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 working some more and working more. My dad never took me fishing. My dad never took me to a ball game. My dad never took me shopping. He couldn't. He was too busy working. And you will say, well, that was the culture. Well, well, not sure about that. I think he could have made a little bit more time for me. <laughs> but he was a great man. Great man by all means. He's home with the Lord now. But, 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 uh, you, you know, uh, I, I remember, I remember that little one flyer that moved me, gave me, gave me the desire to want to go to church. And the moment I walked inside this church, I, I got to be honest, I felt something that I never felt nowhere else. Nowhere else. I felt love. I felt accepted. I felt like somebody cared about me. And, and, and here's where I wanted to get to. The only reason... 38 years later I'm here because somebody invested in me somebody opened up their hands and they gave to me their time their energy my pastor took interest in me took me out every week to go and get coffee and it was probably a buck uh, a dollar a cup of coffee or 25 cents when that wasn't the issue the size of the wallet wasn't the issue it was his heart and I saw that he cared about me, man. And he took me and we bought coffee. And he would minister to me. Because he knew that I had no knowledge of Christ. I had not, I had, I didn't know about salvation. I didn't know about reconciliation. I didn't know about deliverance. I thought that by the time I would hit 21, surely I'm going to die. I was living a little rough life like some of you. And I says, man, if I can make it at 21, I'm blessed. Well, by the grace of God, God saved me. Hallelujah. And I didn't have to worry about that anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Listen to me. Here's a key thought. Generosity goes way beyond the size of the wallet, your feelings. Generosity is about an attitude. Too many Christians fall victims to a terrible trap called materialism. And we must be careful in this day and age because everything is about materialism. Every day when you turn on your TV, there's 3,000 commercial ads just on commercialism, materialism. Thousands of ads trying to catch our heart, catch our attention so that our focus is on getting rather than giving. Life has changed, has it not? We're more interested in getting, 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 rather than giving. I want more. Come on, girlfriend, you got 65 pairs of shoes. I'm not sure if she'll see this program, but my, one of my sisters, don't get mad at me now, on TV. She had one pair of shoe for every day of the year. She actually built a closet just for her shoe yeah i'm talking about you in case my sister watches me on tv and and one day i, w I went into her house and i says what's this room and it was closed it was shut she goes oh that's nothing i said i, I want to see your house open, open this door she didn't want to open up the door 
She opened the door. I said, whoa. It, I, I thought I was at a shoe store. Boxes from the floor. I ain't lying to you. About this high. From the floor. All a, a way around. And the funny thing about it. She knew every shoe. Oh yeah, those are the blue ones. I says, you know that? Little, yeah, those are the blue ones I got at Macy's. What about this box? Oh yeah, those are the ones I got at J.C. JCPenney. Every shoe. And then she says, unfortunately, I'm not done yet. I says, oh, you're way beyond being done. Be careful that we don't just want more and more and more. And God wants us to be givers. As Yeshua Reds and Yeshua take their place here this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us in a little bit. Put your hands together and let's give Jesus praise this morning. <laughs> quickly, quickly. Let me reiterate. What does God want us to know this morning? Here it is. Generosity is about our attitude, not our feelings. Somebody shout amen. Generosity is about the condition of our heart. Never, never the size of our wallet or our bank account. And thirdly, he wants us to know that generosity is about one's willingness to give. To open up our hands wide and give. Amen, somebody? Something happens, church. It really does. Something happens when you open up your, your hands wide and you start giving. That's what God wanted the Israelites to catch. And I pray that you will catch that this morning. Something happens when you open up your hands wide and you give of yourself, you give of your abilities, you give of your talent, you give of your effort, you give of your time, you give of your finances, you give whatever you can to help somebody. Stand with me, and I want you to give the Lord a beautiful hand of praise. Come on, stand with me this morning. Come on, somebody give him a hand of praise. Somebody give him a hand of praise. Hallelujah. Don't stop. Somebody give my hand a praise. Sing that song. Throw your hands up in the air. Hello, my name is Max Garza. This is my wife, Belinda. We are the pastors of the Victory Outreach Church here in the beautiful city of Portland, Oregon. I pray that you've been blessed with today's message. I want to invite you to come and be a part of one of our services, either on Wednesday at 7 p.m. or Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We are located in the corner of 160th and Southeast Star. And we have a great church that's been waiting for you and your entire family to come on out and visit us. God bless you. We'll wait for you. We'll see you soon. God bless you.